morning and welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in Bitcoin, blockchain and digital assets. I'm your host, Jen Sanasi, here with my co-hosts, Emily Parker, Coindesk's Executive Director of Global Content and the Ties Director of Content, Lawrence Lewitin. Good morning to you both. Good morning. All right, let's take a look at what's happening in these markets. The Coindesk Bitcoin price XBX index is above $30,000. Wow, what a day it is. $30,059, up about 1.6% as we wait for that CPI data. Let's take a look at what's happening with Ether, the Coindesk Ether price ETX index at 1,868, up about 1.3%. And DeFi assets, Coindesk's DeFi index, the DFX is at 124, up about 2.7%. Everything is in the green on a Wednesday morning. Let's take a look at our top story now. A new report from Bernstein predicts that the stablecoin market could grow to nearly $3 trillion in the next five years. It currently stands at about $125 billion today. Analysts expect major financial and consumer platforms to issue co-branded stablecoins to, quote, power value exchange on their platforms. Lawrence, you were asking our guest about exactly this yesterday, more stable coins being launched by big tech and financial players. What did you make of this uh, report? I, you know, it's a it's f- trying to predict crypto in five years. Anything in crypto in five years <laughs> is a pretty, pretty. Uh, I mean, look, five years ago, where were we? Twenty eighteen, middle of crypto winter, post post. Uh, that first twenty thousand dollar bubble, and uh, we we honestly wouldn't have guessed we were here. I, I I'm not even sure I would say this is higher or lower than what what some of the more enthusiastic people would have said. I think Tom Lee probably had he had Bitcoin at twenty five thousand dollars, though he didn't really explain why. Um, I, I I don't know exactly. I I think that three trillion dollar mark. I mean. Look, you, you have a lot of competition, and also, how are you going to define crypto? Is it going to be CBDCs? It's stable coins here they're talking about, but what will stable coins look like? Right? We, you know, there was that the rise of the algorithmic stable coins no one saw coming, and the fall of the algorithmic stable co- coins that everyone saw coming, but no one wanted to say. You know, and they started getting tattoos of that. But I, I think it's uh, one of those things where, you know, you could pull a number out of the air. I'm, I'm trying to be polite because we have uh, Professor Massett coming up, and I don't want him to, hear, him to hear me use foul language. But you could pull a number out of the air um, and just say, "Yeah, that's where I see it in five years." And you know, in crypto, that's a long time from now. I'm, I'm kind of with you, Lawrence. I feel like a lot of these predictions that we see and and these reports um, are it's it's interesting when you when you see the data or a lack of data behind some some of these predictions. It could really go anywhere, and I think history has told us that. Emily, what do you think? I just think it depends a lot on what happens with stablecoin regulation. And that's what our next guest can talk to us about, because we're seeing uh, various countries that are way ahead of the United States in terms of stablecoin regulation, like Europe or Japan. And, you know, I think the stablecoin market will in some some degree depend on, you know, how, how countries regulate it. All right, let's now do just that and turn to the state of crypto. The state of crypto is presented by Tron, connecting the world to the power of cryptocurrency. PayPal's PYUSD marks the first time a major financial firm is backing its own stablecoin. Joining us now to discuss what that means for U.S. crypto regulation is Timothy Massad, former CFTC chairman and current director of the Digital Assets Policy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome, Tim. Good to see you back on the show. I'm so happy you're here today because there's so much to talk to you about. <laughs> um, it's great to so, be here. Thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, this is your perfect person to kind of tease because this, this is very, there's just a lot of confusing things going on right now because on the one hand, you know, we still have this sort of stable coin, I don't know, paralysis in Washington, right, which you know more about than, than almost anybody, even though we've made some incremental gains, it's still not really going anywhere. And then we have this massive stable coin news, on the other hand. So let's just like, could you just sort of put this all together for us? Because, you know, we had um, Paxos on yesterday sort of talking about this as you know, this is a this is a, a regulated stable coin, because they are regulated yeah. as a trust in New York. But then there still isn't really any stable coin regulation. So like, is this a step forward for stable coins? Or, or 
I just how, what's the big picture story here? Sure. Well, let me just first say I am an advisor to PayPal, so I want to make sure everyone's aware of that. On the on the overall stablecoin regulation front, you know, I've called for uh, creating a federal framework now for some time, and I still think we need that. Now we saw the House Financial Services Committee pass a bill. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't have as much Democratic support as I would have liked. And I think, you know, the Democrats, uh, many of them on the committee felt like it still wasn't quite designed properly in terms of establishing adequate minimal federal standards. You know, we have this issue of we want to have some sort of state chartering ability, just as we do with banks. But how do you make sure that doesn't lead to regulatory arbitrage to a race to the bottom? I would hope that issue, you know, could still be talked about and maybe the committee can still come up with a compromise that makes it more of a bipartisan approach. Um, Of course, though, we still have the Senate where it's very hard. Uh, But, you know, you referred to what international jurisdictions are doing, and many of them are moving forward. Uh, Singapore, Europe, the UK, the UAE. And that could also, you know, prompt the US to move a little faster. On the PayPal announcement, um, you know, this is a major step. It is, as you note, the first time a a, uh, traditional finance company has launched its own stablecoin. Frankly, it's also, to me, one of the first times that a traditional financial company have said, we think this technology has value outside of crypto. You know, we've seen Fidelity, BlackRock, and others say we want to enter this space. They're entering it to make crypto available to their customers as an investment. PayPal is saying we think this technology could be beneficial in payments more generally. And so I think that's a good thing. I think, frankly, PayPal's move might also create more momentum toward creating a regulatory framework, or, a federal regulatory uh, framework, that is. Yeah, I mean, it's so so you, you're probably following this more closely than I am. But like from what I saw about what happened with that bill in Washington, it seemed like the two sides were pretty far apart, right? Like you had Maxine Waters basically calling it extremist, right? And, and, and just saying that it was, it was and, and that there were the, you know, all these different licenses. And then, you know, so, so it, I guess the, I guess the question I'm asking is, um, is this in the interim, basically what PayPal is doing? Is this kind of like a, a way around that, you know, like go, you know, cause they're, they're basically yeah. saying, okay, okay, because we have a prudential, you know, regulation because we're registered as a trust in New York, that sort of protects users. I mean, is this sort of something that companies can do in the interim? Like, I, I don't know, go through New York, register as a trust, and that provides some sort of security in the absence of any federal regula- re- regulation? Well, I, I, I think PayPal, launched its effort under the laws as it exists today. Uh, Just the way, you know, Circle is licensed in New York. Um, And frankly, I think PayPal's design uh, is a a good one in the sense that I think they are trying to uh, design uh, the safest uh, structure, if you will, from a consumer protection standpoint, with the arrangement with Paxos, with the limited purpose trust and so forth. Um, That's the framework we have today. Uh, We don't have a federal, you know, stable coin framework. I would say on the on the issue of the House um, committee, I'm not sure the two sides are that far apart. I mean, I guess maybe I just want to be optimistic here. But I think the real issue or the key issue is this question of state chartering versus federal chartering. And I would think that there are a variety of ways that we could come up with a role for the states uh, while still ensuring minimal federal standards, whether that's because you specify in federal law what those state standards, what the minimum standards need to be, or whether you condition it on the size of a stable coin. You know, if it's above a certain size, it has to meet these additional federal standards, or you could even condition it on access to a federal master account. I think there are ways, I would hope there are ways to bridge that gap. 
Now, uh, Paxos head of strategy was on the show yesterday. He said they are talking to large tech firms, large financial firms about the potential of other stable coins. We just talked about that Bernstein rep uh, Bernberger report. Um, tell us, do you think that this is going to pressure the U.S. to look at a CBDC again with these stable coins uh, coming out, with these news headlines coming out? Well, I've always thought that the U.S. should do more in terms of research and development for a CBDC. I'm not convinced yet that uh, we need to create one. Frankly, you could argue that we already have a wholesale CBDC, if you will, in the sense that banks have reserve accounts at the Fed, which are essentially digital. But I think it is important for the U.S. to do more research and development and to be more involved in the international standards that are beginning to be thought about and be created in this space because, you know, other nations are moving in this way. Um, I've always thought, though, that there should be both uh, that government research as well as the private market creation of of stable coins. You know, we still don't know just how important this technology will be. You know, how much can it contribute to efficiency and speed and cost savings and, you know, the value of programmability and so forth. But I think all that, you know, is a worthwhile endeavor, both from a private market standpoint and from the government standpoint. Yeah, you know, another topic that I brought up yesterday is this. We, we have Elon Musk renaming his company X, and it looks like he wants it to be an everything app, including a way to transmit money. I guess, I, I guess that's probably where that's going. Uh, sure. he, he's pretty much hinted that that's, if not said more explicitly. Uh, does that change the way, especially now that that this has happened so soon. Does that change what Congress or how Congress will approach regulation? Uh, should they should they eventually pass something? Does it change the way uh, the, the entire uh, regulators in general sure. will approach it? Because they were very very strongly against Facebook getting into the stablecoin sure. business. How will they approach X getting either into the stablecoin business or into the the Rails business of any kind? Sure. Very good uh, question. Look, we've always had a notion uh, <laughs> that there should be a separation, that there should be a separation between banking and commerce, right? So when you get into the stablecoin issue, uh, the question is, how does that then apply? Now, PayPal was a pay is a payments company. It's always been a payments company. This is what it does. It's not a crypto company. Facebook was a social media platform that had no uh, activity in financial services, and that was one of the things that concerned regulators. Uh, Elon Musk obviously has been interested in financial services uh, for decades. I mean, he was thinking about the Internet of Value before we even called it that. But Twitter, you know, is not a financial services company today, or X is not a financial services company today. So this issue of if you have a payments company, what other activities should it be allowed to engage in is an important one. Now, the stablecoin legislation that the committee uh, passed does have some provision for uh, addressing this. Uh, so I think this will be, you know, this will be an ongoing issue of where do you draw that line? Now, of course, some payments companies would say, well, we're really more technology, com we're more like a technology company than a bank. Um, and so, you know, we have to think about that. Has, has the notion of what we're trying to achieve with this separation between commerce and banking changed, meaning that it used to be about we didn't want credit allocation decisions being tainted by an association between a bank and a commercial firm. Now, you know, the Facebook uh, issue with Libra really posed the question, well, we don't want uh, – a platform that has huge amounts of data on us to be able to use that, you know, in an improper way, or at least that was one of the issues that people were talking about. So 
What I'm saying is I think we still have to think about what is the proper range of activities that a payments company can engage in beyond payments. Uh, how do we define that? Um, I think that will be important uh, in the discussion. So I guess just to kind of round this off here, Tim, I mean, do you really think that this is going to propel Congress to come to sort of some sort of compromise? Um, I mean, what, what, I guess what do you see is, is the next steps here? Because yeah. we um, I, I, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying PayPal's move in particular will, but I think it's, you know, it's going to be a contributing factor, just as Emily, as you pointed to what's happening in other jurisdictions. Look, you know, the U.S. often moves slowly. Uh, hopefully, we get to the right answer uh, eventually. I'm still optimistic we will. It may take time, um, but you know, I think the market moves forward, and I think sooner or later uh, we're we're going to have to uh, create a federal framework for this. All right. Thank you, Chair Massad, for joining the show. Wonderful Thank as you. always to have you on. Okay. That was Timothy Massad, former CFTC chairman and current director of the Digital Asset Policy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. We're going to take a quick break. Coming up, we'll be talking about the crypto markets as Bitcoin breaks above $30,000 right after this. Bitcoin topped $30,000 this morning as the market continues to digest weaker than expected trade numbers out of China for July and a wallet awaits for U.S. data scheduled inflation data scheduled for release this week. Well, joining us now to discuss the markets is crypto, no, tasty crypto head or head or tasty crypto, Ryan Grace. Ryan, Welcome. Hey, good morning. Thank you for having me on the show. Still, still trying to absorb this whole idea. Is like, is you, is you, do you have a tasty crypto head? Is it like, how does this work? Uh, anyway, is it like lettuce? Anyway, uh, so we, of course, uh, we see Bitcoin. Uh, it, it finally broke above $30,000. Um, this has been a tight range for a while, right? We've been sitting around 29, 30 quite some time. How long are we going to be here? Is there going to, what's going to move the needle? Yeah, I think ultimately what's going to move the needle is the liquidity impulse is probably a shift in the market's view as to 
what the Fed does next. You know, there's still some uncertainty there. Are we going to see another hike or not? Right now, Fed funds isn't necessarily pricing that in, but some data points could change that. Um, we have seen inflation come down backward looking, and I think, you know, the, the market is encouraged about that. But ultimately, I think long term, it's going to really rely on more stimulus, not just out of the Fed, but but globally. Um, given, you know, I think when you look at Bitcoin, you know, how it tends to behave or how it's viewed as kind of digital gold in a sense. So I think largely it hinges on liquidity, but there's so many positive catalysts throughout this bear market that I think we can get excited about that you know, really help to establish a strong foundation here. And, and maybe that's why we haven't gone lower. Um, we've only traded sideways. But what's not trading sideways, of course, is volatility. I, and, uh, you know, I, I actually took a look at the at the money vols uh, yesterday uh, and it's pretty low. You see it as it, this. You said this is the lowest it's been in four years. I mean, it's it's this has been incredibly low. The at the money volatility. Um, there was a slight P, uh, uh, spike up, of course, uh, back in June when you had the, uh, the the ETF filing. But other than that, this has been a steady progression downwards. Um, does that change at all? I mean, are we starting to see Bitcoin becoming almost a normal asset? Yeah, you know, I think over time, as the asset class matures, this is exactly what you would expect to see. You would expect to see volatility, implied volatility in there as well, come down um, you know, for a variety of reasons. Now, when we look at this historically uh, across assets, volatility tends to be mean reverting. So I don't think that we stay at this extremely low levels. And at these levels, yeah. there might be an opportunity. But uh, it has come down quite a bit from the 100 to 150 levels or vols that we've seen you, in the past. You're talking about implied vols. Implied vols or, or historic vols? Uh, I'm talking about both, really. But implied vol, right. um, if we look at the bit vol index, a 30-day implied vol is going to be around 40% or it was last I checked. I think the low in there is 37. Um, when I look at realized vol, even lower. Um, I haven't looked at it this morning, but you know, we've been trading with a 20 handle, 25% or so um, was the low in there. And so I think you will see that mean revert. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that Bitcoin vol is going to go back to 100 anytime soon, but it's certainly something to be aware of. And you know what I love about crypto is that you have this kind of inverse relationship, and it's a bit counterintuitive to what you see across traditional assets, where that volatility spike often comes with an upside move in the underlying spot price. And I think you could again see that. I just don't know what the catalyst is for it here on the horizon as we've traded sideways really for the last few months. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some other news we haven't brought up on the show just yet. Coinbase announced Base, its layer two blockchain um, is now available this morning. Several announcements are coming out from different parts of the industry uh, in regards to partnerships. Talk to us about what this means for markets, DeFi markets in particular. Yeah, I think it's certainly extremely exciting for Coinbase. I think when I first heard of this news, um, you can kind of see their their vision. I would expect others to go down this route as well. But I think this is maybe the next catalyst to bring a lot of people that are in crypto but aren't necessarily in DeFi or aren't necessarily on chain to these applications. Where today, you know, for the most part, there's still that technical barrier to participating in decentralized applications, to swapping on a DEX. It's not that difficult, but for the average user, there's a lot of steps that you have to take, right? I might have to first send my assets off exchange to a self-custody wallet. I might have to bridge to an L2. I then have to connect to the protocol, understand how to use that protocol with base this is going to almost vertically integrate a lot more of those activities and keep that user within the Coinbase ecosystem. So ultimately, it's going to be a lot easier for somebody that has a Coinbase account to maybe provide liquidity to a decentralized exchange like Uniswap. And I think that given the use cases that exist out there, you'll see more utility, you'll see more developers come to this as well. And ultimately, it's, it's really beneficial for DeFi and for crypto. Does it come with a risk, though? Because, of course, you, you, you had this situation with Bald, uh, you know, that rug pull that happened with Bald a few a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. And then also, too, I mean, bridges have been notorious for being these sort of uh, uh, ways in for people to, to hack and cause all sorts of havoc here. Um, is this a risk to the to 
to Coinbase, the company itself, by being associated with something like this? You know, I think there's definitely risks, obviously, with kind of the early stage technology and, and where we are in the grand scheme of things. There's certainly risk associated with that. I don't know how much of a risk it is to Coinbase as a company, given that, you know, I think the biggest risk to them right now is still regulatory risk um, and, and the SEC lawsuit. So that's ongoing. Um, there is, again, the technical risk with the, the chain. And you've seen, uh, you know, the ball token probably wasn't... Uh, the best way to start in terms of the rug pull. But I think longer term, if you can look past that, um, you know, and you look at the liquidity that Coinbase can bring to this and the user base it already has, um, I think those risks will be minimized over time. But it's not to say that there aren't risks. And, you know, the biggest risk here is whether or not it is adopted. Um, it's exciting news. Coinbase has come out with exciting news previously, and it hasn't really panned out maybe the way it was anticipated. And I'm talking about the NFT marketplace and and not to throw shade on Coinbase, but we still need to see whether or not users will participate. So I would look at the TVL on the chain. I think the, the Binance chain is, is kind of an example or um, a parallel that we could analyze, but that's also a risk that it's, um, you know, it, it still needs to be used. All right, Ryan, thanks for joining the show and being with us this morning. Thank you. That was the head of Tasty Crypto, Ryan Grace. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, a music icon is entering the metaverse. Find out who that is right after this. Good morning and welcome back to First Mover. The Sandbox is having Elvis Presley enter the metaverse with a public sale of the music icons, NFT avatars. Starting today, joining us now to discuss is co-founder and chief operating officer for The Sandbox, Sebastian Bourget. Sebastian, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We have to talk about this. These NFTs are going to give <laughs> users voting rights for the Elvis Legacy Council DAO. What is that? What are they getting voting rights for? If I go out and get one of these Elvis Presley NFTs, what do I get to do with it? Well, I think like the first thing we want to mention is like bringing this collection of 3,000 unique avatar NFT that you can use as your digital identity to play into the sandbox and like make wild memories, show yourself with this like signature hairstyle, with your iconic outfit and 
signature move. Like this is quite exciting. Like you're showing like everyone is famous. Everyone uh, like Elvis Presley is so famous, and everyone like to dress as him somehow. Like there's no city in the world where you don't meet one uh, person that's at a famous uh, place is dressing like him. And now we're bringing that into the metaverse to create those memories, share those moments together, and come up together. There will be an event going on afterwards for avatar owners to engage and earn reward and create new memories and connect uh, all together from anywhere in the world into this virtual world at Sandbox. So it's really exciting. And uh, I think like this is the first utility that we should look at. And further down the line, like we want to always bring more utility for our NFT holders and avatar holders, as we've been doing in the past already with over 16 famous uh, avatar collection and all the content that launched in Sandbox. And this is part of it. It seems like the conversation around the metaverse has kind of been deflating. I'm not sure if you heard me, so I'm just going to repeat that. It feels like the conversation around the metaverse has kind of been deflating now, and the conversation around Web3 gaming has been ramping up. When we talk about metaverse and Web3 gaming, is there a, a blurred line there for you? You know, when I hear about it, it feels like it's probably one and the same. We're building these games in the metaverse and creating these immersive experiences. It, it's part of it. And I think like Elvis Presley is a great example. Like the content that you're finding in the sandbox is much more than game. It's like social experience, like the social aspect is essential and it brings like values uh, thematics such as music, such as fashion, such as sport, such as culture. Uh, Sandbox is really unique in the sense that more than 40% of our user base and the content uh, comes from Asia, for example, 30% from Europe and the rest from North and South America. And uh, like you are accessing experiences that include gaming mechanics, but are not your typical games. So it's broadening access to a wider audience that can become creator, that can interact for the first time and like make new friendships, share those memories and moments together and explore, discover content. They spend more time exploring in the sandbox than actually like playing in traditional mobile game or um, like your social media application. Like you just spend an average of 30 minutes to 50 minutes a day in sandbox. So that's quite exciting. And I think it, we are a great platform to bring all that culture, all that entertainment content all together and make fans engage in new ways, more significant ways than what we've seen before in uh, Web2 and social media. So, so, so uh, music from the 70s, that, um, wild clothing. Okay. What, how come how you, said, come you, you said don't recently have to that uh, uh, sorry to follow up on your Asia question you said recently that um, Korea was the largest metaverse market in the world and um, you know I, I'd actually love to hear you talk more about just web3 <laughs> gaming Asia versus sort of the US market because that's become like an increasingly hot topic and I'm just curious like if you see a real difference in sort of just the um, attitude towards it in Asia versus you know the US and, and, and Europe for example. Absolutely. That's a great question. And like, uh, yes, I'd like to reiterate that Asia is a growing market for Sandbox, representing 40%. Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, Thailand, Singapore, they are leading the charge. They represent already in our top 10 of landowners, of creators, of local regional partners who are stepping in, acquiring a land and launching their experiences in Sandbox for engaging. So we're definitely seeing a lot of uh, interest from all the audiences uh, in Sandbox platform, creators, players, uh, brands. And of course, like we know that there's a lot of um, uh, DeFi trading as well, uh, and the token cryptocurrencies adoption in Asia. And uh, that is also reflecting in Sandbox uh, and, and more broadly in the metaverse adoption. But just to put sort of a finer point on it, because you did say that, you know, Korea was like the largest metaverse market in the world. Um, is there sort of more adoption in Asia sort of rel like, I mean, because I mean, that's something that, you know, I've recently been in, in Asia quite a lot. That's something that I'm actually hearing quite often that there's sort of more enthusiasm for Web3 gaming in Asia um, compared to the US. And I'm just curious if, if that you're seeing a similar thing. Absolutely. Like you can notice like all the recent announcement that's up in Hong Kong, typically making it one of the prime destination now for uh, many projects in 
Web3 in gaming, the adoption uh, of like several uh, cryptocurrencies, including the SAN token, by uh, being recognized uh, here by the Hong Kong government. Japan as well has made several announcements and moving forward uh, toward like promoting blockchain and Web3 in general. And gaming is one of the use cases that uh, Metaverse has been two of the use cases here that benefit uh, the most. So yes, I'm also on the ground very often in Asia and, and I can feel the energy from the community there and, and projects. And, and you know, why, I, I, why I was, do you think it is? Why do you think there's more enthusiasm in Asia? I'm just curious what you think the reason is. I think it's, it's first cultural, like Asia has like uh, a very, um, like m the mentality in Asia is like, they are moving very fast in terms of um, by adopting technology in terms of uh, like business and like the population, they are like, there's more Gen Z users. They are like very well connected uh, to internet for almost 20 years. They had fiber internet, they had MMORPG virtual worlds before. Now they are a large portion of population everywhere, and not only in the metropolis, but also in the countryside are connected to internet. They are using uh, application and services to connect and get pretty much everything done digitally. They are already buying uh, like digital asset as well. Uh, like we know Korea typically has been one of the largest market where users were buying virtual currency and trading digital goods, even before blockchain was available and NFT were available. So for me, it, it's part of like uh, very much the continuation of that. There is much less friction toward like having a digital identity interacting in the world, creating and more uh, there. I want to circle back to the beginning of this segment. Uh, the Elvis NFTs that we were chatting about yeah, gives users the rights to vote on the Elvis Legacy Council DAO. Can you just walk us through that? What is it? What do people get to do once they have this NFT? Mm -hmm. So, well, the first thing is like at Sandbox, they will be able to interact uh, with each other to express themselves with those dance and move. Then they can uh, like enter special events where they will earn reward by the complete quest and gather all together. Then moving along, like they will be having like uh, be able to participate in decentralized decision on like where they can use that identity uh, even more, how they can connect with uh, their avatar and uh, participate to creating uh, the Elvis Presley legacy uh, in the metaverse as well. I think it's really important to take that aspect into consideration on the platform like Sandbox because we are heavily user-generated content and community-driven. So giving voice to users and MNT of there to participate into that, I think it, it, it's essential. So no Claude Francois uh, uh, NFT anytime soon, right? I mean, I it, think it, Elvis Presley so is, is much more like a global icon. Like again, like really? you can meet them in Japan, in uh, in Europe, in France. Claude Francois, maybe. Uh, why not? Well, like maybe someone will do it. But, but in all seriousness, I'm, I, I mean, uh, you know, yes, you, you do go after a, a large icon here, but why not? Say, you know, like, uh, is it that much effort to create small? Uh, you know. NFTs around smaller icons versus uh, somebody as big as that. I mean, like, yeah, Johnny Holiday. Okay, fine. Like, what, what would? How much effort is is going into making an a, a Elvis NFT versus a, a, a smaller name, a more regional name? I think like it's not about like um, like on the technology side and the workflow, the process that we put in place to craft those uh, unique avatar. Each one has those uh, different aesthetic and move and etc. It's a very uh, it's a well-rounded process. Like within two to three months, we can launch our original collection, and we are usually introducing two to three a month now with our team, and we've trained like the ecosystem to do the same. So now like builders are also introducing their own collection. Uh, the importance is like, does it matter? Is it relevant for the fans as well? And I think Elvis Presley represents something that's again, iconic and global for uh, rock and roll for like broader family friendly generation. But we have also launched collections for like, uh, that we're going to introduce several after collection that relates more to our like Japanese IPs, manga, anime, uh, that we have avatar collection from a very popular uh, Korean TV show that's coming up. Don't want to reveal everything, but it's part of like, what do you do to attract 
those uh, users into metaverse, no matter where they are. And it doesn't matter if it's only popular regionally or globally at the end of the day. I'll, I'll wait for the Enrico Macias one. <laughs> All right, Sebastian, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining the show. Thank you very much. Have a great day and see you in the metaverse. <laughs> see you there. All right, that was uh, co-founder and chief operating officer for the Sandbox, Sebastian Bourget. Prosecu prosecutors still plan to bring a campaign finance-related charge against FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried after two weeks saying they couldn't do to treaty obligations. Joining us now to discuss is our own Elvis, Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor, Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk State of Crypto Newsletter with his own team of hound dogs. Good morning, Chris, uh, Nick. Okay, uh, let's talk about what happened here. Why the DOJ changed its mind? Why are they now, how are they after going after Sam Bankman Fried over this uh, whole thing with uh, uh, campaign finance? So I don't know if the DOJ did indeed change its mind, right? If you look back at the late July notice that the DOJ sent saying that they were going to drop the campaign finance charge, what they said specifically is it wasn't in the extradition paperwork that the Bahamas created when they arrested Sam Bankman fried And so uh, under treaty obligations, the U.S. couldn't bring that specific charge. Um, what the DOJ said yesterday is, OK, fine, we're not going to bring that specific charge. We will fold the allegations into a different charge and still, you know, bring forward the campaign finance claims and try Sam Bankman-Fried on them when he goes to trial in October. And, uh, you know, how many charges are we looking at here? So we're looking at a total of seven and they're basically, uh, you know, everything that was initially alleged back in December of 2022. So wire fraud, conspiracy for wire fraud, uh, securities fraud, uh, commodities fraud, conspiracy for fraud, things like that. And, uh, and Ryan Salami, uh, what's that? Yeah. yeah Ryan no, Salami is uh, uh, looking at campaign finance. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Ryan Salami is, uh, uh, he's, he's singing like a songbird, isn't he? So the timing of that report, I would say, is interesting. Um, Ryan Salami, the, you know, one of the key things from his end, you know, as far as the allegations are concerned, is that the implications over the last couple months seem to have been that he has been kind of the Republican uh, donor on Sam Bankman-Fried's behalf. Uh, so where Sam Bankman-Fried was donating to Democrats publicly and you know under his name, Salami was in charge of routing money to Republicans to you know ensure that all their bases were covered. So if he's, you know, as I think we can assume from yesterday's reporting, uh, going to turn witness at Sam Bankman-Fried's trial pursuant to a plea deal, then we might get a lot more information about you know how exactly. Uh, you know, this entire thing shook out who, uh, who all, you know, Sam Bankman-Fried directed donations to. Indeed, whether or not he is, you know, being protected by Democrats for uh, whatever, as I think we saw a couple of conspiracy theorists uh, suggest after the charge was initially dropped. All right, um, Nick. Party overlooked again. Thanks for being with us this morning. That was Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor, Nick Day. I'm Jen. That's Emily. That's Lawrence. That's it for First Mover. We'll see you tomorrow.